Moderator, I notice as a guest of the Lord High Commissioner, the Archbishop Emeritus of Cape Town, Right Reverend Desmond Tutu, sir, and I wonder if you would invite the Assembly to address us. Archbishop, you honour us with your presence here today and the Assembly are delighted that you could take the time to come and be with us and we warmly invite you to address us this morning. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so very much for the great honor of addressing this august gathering of the General Assembly of the Church of Scotland. And permit me also to thank their graces, the Lord High Commissioner and his spouse for their welcome and hospitality at Holy Road House palace. You must have heard the story of the preacher, as we tend to do, who went on for a long time. <clears throat> and, and then eventually he said, what more can I say? And somebody at the back of the church said, Amen. <laughs> I will try not to emulate his example. <laughs> there is another story that I do want to tell you. It's of a, of a traveler through the countryside who stops by a field where he sees the farmer standing at the fence and admiring his field of corn swaying in the breeze and the traveler comes and stands next to the farmer and after a while he says whoa what a wonderful work you have done with God just look at this beautiful field of corn the farmer kept quiet a little, took one or two puffs on his pipe and said, <clears throat> yes, but you should have seen what it was like when God had it all to himself. <laughs> <laughs> isn't, it, isn't it just one of those extraordinary paradoxes that we have this omnipotent God who quite strangely becomes impotent in the face of the wilderness of, of injustice and oppression. This God does not send lightning bolts to strike down the perpetrators of injustice and oppression. God stands there impotent waiting, yes, waiting, waiting until there will be those who are willing to turn this wilderness into a gorgeous garden of blooming flowers.
when we were struggling against that awful system, apartheid, in South Africa, how wonderful it was to be able almost to luxuriate in, in the tremendous support that we receive from our sisters and brothers in other parts of the world. People were willing to, to be arrested on our behalf. People demonstrated on our behalf. People boycotted South African goods on our behalf. People prayed, held vigils on our behalf. And you here in Edinburgh were quite outstanding in that support. So that today, hey, here we are, free, free, free because of the extraordinary collaboration that you forged with God to turn that wilderness of injustice and oppression in South Africa into a burgeoning garden of freedom and democracy. Yes. One of the incredible privileges that I have had in years is being able to go to places. Some I have been to before, uh, asking, please help us. Some I might not have. But to return to those places or to go to those places for the first time and say, we asked for your help and you gave it. And voila, and Nelson Mandela walks out of prison. Voila, just look, just look at this ghastly apartheid which has turned into a democracy so that we can have had as we recently had our fourth democratic election. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. But I'm going to say hold your applause. I'm, I'm, going, to, I'm going to tell you some, some more reasons why uh, you are going to be feeling slightly uh, embarrassed. Uh, and, and bashful, um, as, as you tend to be. Uh, <laughs> <clears throat> the, the Church of Scotland has a distinguished record in, in places such as Malawi, Zambia, Zimbabwe, South Africa. We certainly owe a great debt to all of you, as your forebears established splendid institutions of education and health, such as Lovedale Institution and Lovedale Hospital. Your Kirk played a significant role in the establishment of the University College of Fort Hare, which for a very, very long time was about the only institution of higher learning in Africa. You trained people like Nelson Mandela, like Oliver Tambo. Yes, I mean, you feel very proud about those. Uh, uh, slightly more dubiously, uh, Robert Mugabe. Uh, uh, and then I had the privilege of teaching for a few years at the Federal Theological Seminary. You supported that. You sent people like John Summers and Ronnie Samuels and, and others. You did a fantastic, a fantastic job. There, 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 there was this 
arid wilderness. And you said, God, yes, we will, we will collaborate with you, impotent God, help you to become what you really are, the omnipotent one. And, and so, friends, ah, you know what? I discovered that I, I had a magic wand. It, it has this extraordinary power that when I wave it over people, as I shall be doing presently, you, you wave it over people and it turns them into instant South Africans. <laughs> so I, I wave it over you and I say, uh, fellow South Africans, uh, let's give these Scots a real humdinger. Right? Come on. <clears throat> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, by the way, yes. Uh, I, I must wave it over you again. And, 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 and you revert to your former shy. <laughs> I was with a group of uh, 2,000 young people in Australia once, and I said, part of our trouble is that we don't celebrate who we are. How about, how about giving ourselves a warm clap just to affirm ourselves? And, and they really went to town. And then I said, uh, well, let's give God a standing ovation. And they nearly took the roof off. <laughs> and when they finished, without uh, thinking, I said, thank you. <laughs> but you know more, more significantly, you taught us that we were called to proclaim the good news and you, Mr. Moderator, have uh, spoken so beautifully about that. To speak, to sp proclaim the good news, the good news of the kingdom of God. To speak truth to power. To cry out, thus says the Lord. You inspired us to condemn the lie at the heart of racism that asserts that what invests people with worth is some arbitrary biological attribute such as skin color. You taught us to say, no, no. What invests people, all people, without exception? invest them with a worth that is infinite. Not, it was not this or that biological irrelevance, but it is the staggering fact that all of us, without exception, were created in God's image. That we, each one of us, Staggeringly, each one of us is a God carrier. That each one of us is a, is a God, God's viceroy, a stand-in for God. That racism was not just evil, which it certainly was, but downright blasphemous, for it is as if we were spitting in the face of God. Whatever the price we might be called to pray, pay, we were constrained by the imperatives of God's gospel of love to speak up for freedom, for justice, for goodness, 
in season and out of season, whether they might hear or forbear to hear, whatever the cost. And some paid a heavy price in personal vilification, turned into an ogre that most of the privileged love to hate. Some were banned from public life, others arrested and tortured and even murdered gruesomely. Some of the evidence of all of this came before us in the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. It has always been so for the servants of the Most High who have the temerity to declare, thus saith the Lord. And Elijah must flee for his life. And Jeremiah is thrown into a cistern to drown. It must ever be so for the Church of God when she declares that injustice, oppression, corruption, whatever, whatever it is that favors the elite, the powerful, must come under the sharp scrutiny. For we are the servants of one who declared that Isaiah's words had found fulfillment in him. The Spirit of the Lord has anointed me, has anointed me to speak good news, not just to any and everybody, but especially to the poor. Ours is a God who is notoriously biased in favor of the poor, the hungry, the downtrodden, those who smell to high heaven in our begging in our streets, who sleep rough, prostitutes, drug addicts, those who are at the edges of our society. Those are, those are our God's favorites. Would you want acceptance even of your worship? Then go and wash your hands clean, for they are full of blood. And then, and then go and do justice, not just to anyone. Go and do justice for the widow, the orphan, and the alien representative of the most impotent in most societies in those days. The Church of God is one that must proclaim, thus saith the Lord. that, hey, we are family, we are family. We have only one whom we call Father. And this one who is our Lord, speaking about his coming, elevation on the cross, said, I, if I be lifted up, I, if I be lifted up, will draw, not some, will draw all, all. An incredibly revolutionary, radical, radical, radical assertion will draw all, all, all into an embrace that will not let, let us go. For in this, in this family, there are no outsiders. All, all are inside us. All are children 
of our Heavenly Father. The rich, the poor, the lame, the blind, the clever, the not so clever, the white, the black, the red, the yellow, all, all, all. The Palestinian, the Israeli, Al Qaeda, Bin Laden, George Bush, all, all, I will, I will draw all, all into this embrace of a love that will not let you go. All, 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 all. All, all, lesbian, gay, so-called straight, all, 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 I will draw all. We are family, we are family, we are sisters and brothers. How in the name of everything that is good can we justify going on spending obscene amounts on budgets of death and destruction when we know that just a minute fraction of those so-called defense budgets would ensure that God's children everywhere, our sisters and brothers, would have clean water to drink, would have enough food to eat, would have a decent home, would, would have affordable health care. How can, how can it be that we, representing this God, can look on when there are those who go to bed hungry, who spend can spend only one dollar a day. How can we? How can we? How can we? <laughs> and our God says, I have no one. I have no one except you. Help me. Help me. Help me to make this a more compassionate world. Help me, please. Help me so that we can make it a more generous, caring. Please, help me. I have no one except you. Help me. Help me. Help me. Thank you. Archbishop, I don't know that I can add any words to the applause that has come to you today, but let me try. Your name resonates strongly with people all around the world. We would be right in calling you the moral voice that speaks out on all matters of poverty, on human rights abuses, on many other matters so dear to your heart and so dear to our heart. Although initially you had thought to follow your father into education, education's loss was the church indeed the world's gain. 
of the end in Johannesburg in 1960. You returned there in 1975 as Dean of St. Mary's, the first black African to hold that position. You became the General Secretary of the South African Council of Churches, national and international figure. You led a formidable crusade in support of justice and racial conciliation in South Africa. Your tireless work recognized when you were awarded the Nobel Peace Prize. You became a key mediator in the difficult transition towards democracy. In 1996, President Nelson Mandela appointed you to chair the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, a body set up to probe gross human rights violations. You remain irrepressible and influential both at home and on a much wider global political stage. Only two years ago, you were appointed chairman of a group of former world, elders, world leaders called the Elders, with the aim of tackling some of the world's most pressing problems. We salute you, we thank you, we congratulate you on coming to Edinburgh University today to receive your honorary doctorate, and we wish you every blessing from God as you continue to work for him and in his name for us throughout the world. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs>